Section 20 of Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. Section 20. The Atom Smasher by Victor Rousseau. Chapters 10, 11, and 12. Chapter 10. The Fight in the Dark. He dropped down softly to the causeway. Within the city he heard a sound such as he had never heard before, as if some ancient prophecy of doom had been fulfilled, a wailing, Aya! 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 that was caught up from throat to throat and rose upon the wind in a clamor wild and mournful as that of the seabirds around the broken eye. It was the death-keening of proud Atlantis, queen of the Atlantic for fifty thousand years. She was dying in darkness. For, with the blinding of the eye, all the soft lights within the city had gone out. Dense, utter, impenetrable darkness reigned, and even the gibbous moon floating overhead seemed to give no light. Jim dropped to the causeway and began running in the direction of the city. But, feeling the drag of his wings, he unbuckled the strap and flung them away. He might need them, but his one thought was to get to Lucille if she were still alive and he felt that each moment lost might mean that he would be too late. Through the blackness he raced forward, hearing that sobbing ululation within the walls. But behind him he heard another sound, and shuddered at it, all his hopes suddenly reversed. For that sound was the shouting of the Drilgos as they rushed forward to conquest. And now it seemed a monstrous thing that proud Atlantis should be at the mercy of these hordes. He had let loose destruction upon the world, but it was to save Lucille. That was his consolation. Yet he hardly checked the racing thoughts within his mind even for a moment to meditate on what he had done. Those thoughts were all of Lucille. He must get to her before the Drilgos entered, and he ran faster, panting, gasping, till of a sudden the portals loomed before him, and he saw a crowd of frenzied Atlanteans struggling to pass through, and a file of soldiers struggling to keep them back. He could distinguish nothing more than the confused struggle. He hurled himself into the midst of the crowd and swept it back. He was within the walls now, and struggling to pass through the mob of people that was swarming like homeless bees. He fought them with flailing fists, he clove a pathway through them, until he found himself in a great shadowy space that he recognized as the central assembly of the city. More by instinct than design, he hit upon the narrow court that was the elevator, but the court was filled with another mob of struggling people, and in the darkness there was no possibility of discovering the secret of raising it. He blundered about, raging, forcing a path now here, now there. He ran into blind alleys, into small threading streets about the court, which led him back into the central place of assembly. It was like a nightmare, that blind search under the pale three-quarter moon and the black, star-blotched sky. Suddenly, Jim found himself wedged by the pressure of the crowd into a sort of recess leading off the elevator court. So strong was the pressure here that he was unable to move an inch. Wedged bolt upright, he could only wait and let the frenzied mob stream past him. And louder, above the sound of wailing, came the roars of the Drilgos swarming along the causeway. Suddenly, something gave behind him, a door, as it seemed, broken off its hinges by the mob pressure. Jim was hurled backward and fell heavily down a flight of stone stairs, bringing up against a stone balustrade. He got up, unconscious of his bruises, ran to the top of the flight, and saw the dim square of palest twilight where the door had been. But over him he could faintly see the stairs and the balustrade winding away to what seemed immeasurable height. That stairway must lead to the top of the building, and thence there should be some access to the amphitheater, Jim turned toward it. Suddenly a tremendous uproar filled the streets, yells, the clicking grunts of the Drilgos, the screams of the panic-stricken populace. The invaders had arrived, and they were sweeping all before them. No chance of recognition in that darkness. Lucille! Shouting her name, Jim began to ascend the stairs in leaps of three at a time. 
but long before he reached the top he was ascending one by one, with straining limbs and laboring breath. Red slaughter down below, a very inferno of sound. Above, that shadowy stairway, still extending almost to the heavens. Step after step, flight beyond flight. Jim's lungs were bursting and his heart hammering as if it would break his chest. One flight more. One more. Another. Suddenly he realized that his task was ended. In place of the stairs stood a vast hall, and beyond that another hall, dim in the faint light that filtered through the glass above. Jim thought he remembered where he was. Beyond that next hall there should be the tongue of flooring, crossing the amphitheater and joining the platform of the idols. But he stopped suddenly as he emerged, not upon the tongue, but upon still another stairway. He had gone astray, and out of his bursting lungs a cry of rage and despair went up. For a moment he stood still. What use to proceed further? And then, amazingly, there came what might have been a sign from heaven. Down through a small square opening overhead, no larger than a ventilator, it came. A glimmer of violet flame. And Jim hurled himself like a madman against the stairs, and surmounted them with two bounds. There were no more. Instead, Jim found himself looking down into the amphitheater. The thick walls had cut off all sound from his ears, save a confused murmur. But now a hideous uproar assailed them. The whole floor of the amphitheater was a mass of moving shadows, of slayers and slain. The Drilgos had broken in and trapped the multitudes that had taken refuge there. Their fearful stone-tipped spears thrust in and out, to the accompaniment of their savage howls and the screams of the dying. Never has such a shadow play been seen, perhaps, as that below, where death stalked in dense darkness, and the slayer did not even see his victim. Only the thrust of spears, the soft, yielding flesh that they encountered, the scream, the wrench of stone from tissue, and the blended howl of triumph and scream of despair. Yet only for a moment did Jim turn his eyes upon that sight, for he knew where he was now. He had emerged upon the other side of the amphitheater, upon the platform where he had seen the priests and dignitaries gathered when he was led forward to be sacrificed. There, in the rear, were the hideous shadowy gods looming up out of the darkness, their outstretched arms interlaced. And there, upon the platform, was the Atom Smasher, a little thread of violet light seeping out of the central tube. Beside it stood a group of figures, impossible to distinguish in the darkness, but of a sudden Lucille's scream rang out above the din below. With three leaps Jim was at her side. He saw the girl, Tota, and Parrish, struggling in the grasp of a dozen priests. They were dragging them toward the idols, and Jim understood what that scene portended. In despair at the eruption of the Drilgos, the priests were seeking to propitiate their gods by sacrificing the three strangers whom they held responsible for all their woes. Jim caught Lucille in his arms, shouting her name. She knew him, turned toward him. Then one of the priests, armed with a great stone-headed club, for no metal is permitted within the precincts of the god Crook, struck at him furiously. Jim leaped aside, letting the club descend harmlessly upon the floor. He shot out his right, with all his strength behind it, catching the priest upon the jaw, and the man crumpled. Whirling the club around his head, he fought back the fanatics, all the while shouting to Tota to start the Atom Smasher. In such a moment, he only remembered that Tota was a white man and of his own generation. He struck down three of the priests, then he was seized around the knees from behind, and fell heavily. The club was wrenched from his hand. In another moment, Jim found himself helpless in the grasp of the Atlanteans. As he stopped struggling for a moment to gather his strength for a supreme effort, he heard a whir overhead and saw the arms of the stone gods begin their horrible revolution. The priests had started the machinery, and high above the din below rang out the wild chant of the high priest. Jim saw him now, a figure poised upon a platform behind the arms, his own arms raised heavenward. Ah! 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 Jim was being dragged forward, with Lucille beside him, old Parrish following, still making a futile struggle for life, while pitiful screeches issued from his mouth. Jim saw the revolving arms descend within a foot of his head. 
One more fight. One more. The last. Suddenly, with loud yells, a band of Drilgos leaped forward from the head of the stairs and rushed upon the struggling priests and victims. And, dark as it was, Jim recognized their leader. Cain. And Cain knew Lucille. As the priests rallied for a desperate resistance, Cain hurled his great body through the air, landing squarely upon the shoulders of the priest nearest the revolving arms, and knocking him flat. Then the arms caught priest and Drilgo, and the steel hooks dug deep into their flesh. A screech of terror, a howl that reverberated through the amphitheater, and nothing remained of either but a heap of macerated flesh. But in that instant Jim had fought free again. He caught Lucille and dragged her back toward the Atom Smasher. Tota had already broken from his captors and was working at it frantically. "'Hold on!' screeched old Parrish. "'Hold on!' They had a moment's leeway. The Drilgos had driven the priests back into the hooks. With awful shrieks, the fanatics were yielding up their lives in the place of their selected victims. But more Drilgos were pouring up the stairs, a moment's leeway, and no more, before the savage band would impale the four upon their stone-pointed spears. There was not the slightest chance that they would be able to make their identity known. "'For God's sake, hurry!' Jim yelled in Toda's ear. The wheels were revolving. A stream of violet light leaping out of the central tunnel cast a lurid illumination upon the scene. But it was too late. A score of Drilgos with leveled spears were rushing on the four. "'Hold tight!' screeched Parrish. He thrust his arm into his breast and pulled out a little lever. Jim recognized it and remembered. It was the instrument of universal death, the uranium release of untold forces of cataclysmic depredation. "'Take that!' screamed the old man, inserting the lever into the secret groove in the Atom Smasher and jerking it in the direction of the priests. End of Chapter 10 Chapter 11 Toda's Last Gamble A roar that seemed to rend the heavens followed. Roar upon roar, as the infinite momentum of the disintegrating uranium struck obstacle after obstacle. The Drilgos vanished, the amphitheater melted away, walls and roof. Overhead were the moon and stars. And proud Atlantis was sinking into the depths of the sea. Not as a ship sinks, but piecemeal her walls and towers crumbling and toppling as a child's sandcastle crumbles under the attack of the lapping waves. Down they crashed, carrying their freight of black, clinging human ants, while from the sea's depths a wave a mile high rose and battered the fragments to destruction. From the crater of the volcano a huge wave of fire fanned forward, and where fire and water met a cloud of steam rose up. A boiling chaos in which water and earth and fire were blended spread over land and sea. And then suddenly it was ended. Where the last island of the Atlantean continent had been, only the ocean was to be seen, placid beneath the stars. The Atom Smasher was vibrating at tremendous speed. Jim, with one arm round Lucille, faced Toda at the instrument board. Nearby sat Parrish, watching him too. That took a whole year, said Toda. That pretty little scene of destruction we've just witnessed. The good old Atom Smasher has been doing some lively stunts, or we'd have been engulfed too. We're not likely to see anything so pretty in history again, unless we go to watch the destruction of Herculaneum and Pompeii by lava from Vesuvius. But that would be quite tame in comparison with this. Toda's jeering tone grated on Jim's ears immeasurably. I don't think any of us are craving any more experiments, Tota, he said, trying to keep his voice steady. Suppose you take us back to Peconic Bay. We'll dump the Atom Smasher into the pond and try to forget that we've had anything except a bad nightmare. Don't trust him, Jim, whispered Lucille. Tota heard. Thank you, he answered, scowling. But seriously, Dent, we can't go back with nothing to show for all our trouble. Those fools tried to betray me, and then the eye went out. Perhaps I have you to thank for that performance? However, the sensible thing is to let bygones be bygones. But we must make a little excursion. How about picking up a little treasure from the hordes of Solomon or Genghis Khan? A few pounds of precious stones would make a world of difference in our social status when we reach Long Island. Jim felt a cold fury permeating him. 
Tota saw his grim look and laughed malignantly. "'Well, Dent, I'm ready to be frank with you,' he said. "'The game's still in my hands. I want Lucille. I'm willing to take you and Parrish back, provided you agree she shall be mine. I'll have to trust you, but I shall have means of evening up if you play crooked.' "'Why don't you ask my girl herself?' piped old Parrish. "'He needn't trouble. He knows the answer.' cried Lucille scornfully. "'There's your answer,' said Jim. "'Now, what's the alternative?' "'The alternative is that I have already set the dial to eternity, Dent,' grinned Tota. "'Eternity in the fifth dimension. Didn't know I'd worked that out, did you? A pleasant little surprise. No, don't try to move. My hand is on the lever. I have only to press it, and we're there.' Jim stood stock still in horror. Tota's voice rang true. He believed Tota had the power he claimed. "'Yes, the fifth dimension, and eternity,' said Tota. "'Where time and space reel into functionlessness. Don't ask me what it's like there. I've never been there. But my impression of it is that it's a fairly good representation of the place popularly known as hell.' "'You fool, Dent!' Tota's voice rang out with vicious, snarling emphasis. I gave you your chance to come in with me. Together we'd have made ourselves masters of Atlantis and brought back her plunder to our twentieth century world. You refused because of a girl, a girl, Dent, who loved me long before you came upon the scene. That's a lie, Lucius, answered Lucille steadily. And you can do your worst. There's one factor you haven't reckoned in your calculations, and that's called God. The dark blur on the spectral lines... Old Parrish muttered. Tota laughed uproariously. Come, make your choice, Dent, he mocked. It's merely to press this lever. You'll find yourself... Well, we won't go into that. I don't know where you'll find yourself. You'll disappear. So shall I. But I'm desperate. I must have Lucille. Choose! His voice rang out in maniac tones. Choose, all of you! Lucille has answered you, Jim retorted. "'And how about you, old man?' called Tota to Parrish. Parrish leaned forward, making a swift movement with his hand. "'Go to your own hell, you dev—' A blinding light, a frantic oscillation of the Atom Smasher, a sense of death, awful and indescribable, and stark unconsciousness rushed over Jim. His last thought was that Lucille's arms were about him, and that he was holding her. Nothing mattered, therefore, even though they too were plunged into that awful nothingness of the fifth dimension, where neither space nor time recognizably exists. Love could exist there. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 Solid Earth He's coming around, Lucille. Thank God for it. Jim opened his eyes. For a few moments he looked about him without understanding. Then the outlines of a room etched themselves against the clouded background, and in the foreground Lucille's face. The girl was bending over Jim, one hand soothing his forehead. "'Where am I?' Jim muttered. "'Back on Earth, Jim. The good old Earth, never again to leave it,' answered Lucille, with a catch in her voice. With an effort she composed herself. "'You mustn't talk,' she said. "'But what place is this?' "'It's Andy Lum's house.' Now rest, and I'll explain everything later. But the first explanation came from Andy Lum. Well, Mr. Dent, my wife and me sure were glad to be on the spot when you and Miss Parrish got bogged on the edge of the Black Pool, he said. Mean, treacherous place it is. Thar was a cow got mired thar last month, up to her belly. If us hadn't found her, and dragged her out with ropes, she'd have gone clear under. Grandpop Dawes says thar's underground springs round the edge and that it runs straight down to hell, though that seems sort of far-fetched to me. Yes, sir, and if I hadn't heard WNYC giving Miss Parrish on the list of missing persons, and as having been seen near here, I reckon I'd never have found you. Made me and my wife uneasy, that did. Andy, she says, I got an inkling you ought to go to the vanishing place and see if she ain't there. And there I found you two, mired to the waist, and Mr. Parrish dancing round and fretting, and his clothes burned to cinders. It sure seems strange to me to think Mr. Parrish got away safe after that explosion five years ago, 
and of his wandering around with loss of memory till you found him and brung him back here to restore it. But there are strange things in the world. Yes, sir, there surely is. In the happiness of being back on earth once more, Jim was content to let further explanations go. The return of Parrish had been duly chronicled in the newspapers, and had provoked a mild interest, but fortunately the public mind was so occupied at the moment with the trial of a nightclub hostess that, after the first rush of newspaper men, the three were left alone. Day after day, in the brilliant autumn weather, Jim and Lucille would roam the tinted woods, recharging themselves with the feel of earth, until the memory of those dread experiences grew dim. "'Well, Jim, I reckon I'd better tell you and get it over,' said old Parrish one morning. Parrish, quite his old jaunty self again. Tota had got the dials pointing to the fifth dimension. Eternity, he called it, though actually I believe it's nothing more than annihilation, a grand smash. Well, he pressed that lever, but something had gone wrong. You remember how poor Cain seemed to take great interest in the Atom Smasher. There's no way of telling what had been going on in that brain of his but it looks to me like he'd known that that lever meant death. It was sealed up in wax, and Tota had got it free on the way out of Atlantis. Well, this is what I made out from examining the thing afterward. Kane had been monkeying with the lever. He'd pried loose one of the wires that hooked to the transformer, and short-circuited it, not knowing, of course, just what he was doing. The result was that when Tota pressed that lever, instead of blowing the whole contraption to pieces, he got a couple of billion volts of electricity through his body, combined with a larger amperage than has ever been imagined. It burned him to a few grease spots. He simply vanished. You don't remember what you did at the moment, boy. I don't seem to remember anything, said Jim. Well, your response was an automatic one. You jumped him. Luckily, you were too late, for Tota vanished like that, old Parrish snapped his fingers. But you must have got into the field of magnetic force. Anyway, you were almost electrocuted. Lucille and I thought you were dead for hours. We laid you down and set a course for home. I used those dial numberings Tota had given me. He'd said they wouldn't work, but he'd lied. They did work. They brought us back to the vanishing place. We carried you out, and then I saw your eyelid twitch. We worked over you with artificial respiration till it looked as if there was a chance for you. Then I shut off the power and let the waters rush in over the atom smasher and swam ashore. And there it lies at the bottom of the pool, and may it lie there till the judgment day. Tota was a genius, said Jim, but he never understood that character counts for more than genius. Let's think no more about him, said Lucille. She had come up to them, and the two looked at each other and smiled. Love is self-centered. Other things it forgets very quickly. Tomorrow we go back to New York, said Jim. You think you'll be able to face the world and take up life again? I think so, Jim, said Lucille. You're not remembering him after all? No, Jim. I was thinking of poor Cain. He died for me. But that was twelve thousand years ago, my dear, and today's today, said Jim. And tomorrow a new life begins for you and me. He drew her closer to him. No, he would never quite forget, but that was twelve thousand years ago, and tomorrow was his wedding day. End of chapter 12 End of The Atom Smasher by Victor Rousseau